Welcome back to the Integrateness Podcast with Jason and Jolene. It's time for Fear Part 2. Yes, the second part of our epic two-part conversation on fear. Last week, Jolene and I talked about like what scares us, what fear is, how it manifests itself in the body. Sometimes it's a good emotion, sometimes it's a bad emotion, etc. and so on. This week, Jolene's already written out a whole list of stuff that you can do to help conquer your fears because you do not want your fear to rule you. And I know people who are my age who have let certain fears rule them their entire lives and they haven't progressed much in life because you can't make progress or improve without doing things that scare you. Right. And being in that place of discomfort. So I should have brought my plastic snake and scared, <laughs> scared the shit out of Jason today. What was I thinking? My son has these stuffy snakes <laughs> and they're fine. Yeah. My mom, my, my mom can't even do that. She can't nope. even look at, yeah, no. And even my kids know that they're like, Oh, we better not take grandma to that part of the store. There's snake toys there. My buddy Sean's oldest boy, Brandon has a snake oh. and Brandon moved back. And I remember going over there one time and, and there's this big like aquarium-y thing out in the, the rec room. We're watching TV. I'm like, what's that? And he's like, he's like, oh, it's the uh, it's the snake cage, right? And you're like, where's and the I'm snake? Like, Is the snake loose? <laughs> and he's like, oh, no, no, no. He got a new one. Because <laughs> I was like, I was ready to like fucking just be out that door. Like, nope. Oh, no. yeah. We had a party at one of my friend's houses way back in high school. And her brother had like this huge like floor to ceiling iguana cage <sighs> and the glass got broken one oh, night. No. Yeah, that was unfortunate. That would be um, kind of creepy, too. Roman okay. Iguanas. Right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, yeah, first of all, let's get you guys reflecting back on the last week. Where were you aware of fear? Where did you conquer some fear? Let's get you back into that space. Now, when we say the word fear and we're talking about it and how it shows up in the body, what's activated this week? Is it the same as last week? Is it different than last week? Those of you who work with me individually will know this is kind of how I start sessions. What's different this time when we think about the same thing? Um, and that's really helpful for us to know if we've made progress in an area, right? So we, we may still be afraid of certain things. We talked about car accidents last yep. time and things like that. And my like I still get activated and triggered, but I it doesn't paralyze me the same way. Um, certain road conditions will activate me. And they'll activate my sympathetic nervous system, but I can re remain in control. My frontal lobe, which is the executive functioning, good decision-making part of my brain doesn't completely disconnect from my system and it stays with its hands on the ha steering wheel, essentially. So those are all the ways that we can stay in control while experiencing the state of fear, the emotion of fear and the actual like nervous system state of fear. So that's really what we're working towards is how do we tolerate the discomfort and remain in control? Yeah, That's which actually one, leads to one of your philosophies you follow a lot, which is Stoicism. Well, yeah, Stoicism. A lot of people think that if you're just one of the Stoics, they use that phrase a lot. Oh, he's mm -hmm. very Stoic in terms of he doesn't show emotion. And the, the perception is you don't feel mm -hmm. feelings, which is actually it's the opposite. You feel them completely, but you're none of them control you. But that includes the positive ones mm. like love, you know, joy. None of that overrules. You are you feel it. It is your guide. And you just kind of keep going. And one of the things that the Stoics do um, is they kind of, you condition the body to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. You know, Marcus Aurelius would always have this thing, like he wrote in his book, Meditations, which is brilliant. I won't do it justice, but like, you know, when you wake up in the morning, you're lying in bed and you're warm and comfy and you just don't want to fucking get up. He has a whole like paragraph about what went through his head one morning. And it's like, you know, it's, you know, it's time to get up and do your work. And it's like, no, it's really nice in here. So you were born to be not to feel good all the time. Where does that get you? If you always feel good, you're not going to make progress. Oh my gosh. And if we were doing EMDR, we would go back and heal the core wound. The initial time that memory was created. And that is coming out of the womb. Right? Oh, that is totally. I'm comfortable yes. in here. I don't want to get out and just do stuff. And so that's their whole thing. So like, you know, in the morning when you have a shower, for the last 30 seconds to minute, just crank that mother as cold as you can get. And I do that every morning, right? Yeah. And it's funny. And then um, if you have a morning exercise routine, when that voice, my Sifu would always call it the voice of failure. And he's, he admitted even he would get it. It's like, I don't want to do my morning workout. But you do it anyways. Because as soon as you start listening to the I don't want to and you stop, it becomes a domino effect. Everything else that you want to do that's hard becomes impossible. So you just don't ever listen to it. And you just push through every single time. And it's hard. It is really, really hard. But the more you do it, 
I find if I'm able to stick to all these, my discipline level remains really strong. And I, yeah, I know I don't fault. Even though in my head's like, I don't want to do the exercise. Just go down. It's almost like an automatic response. You're not yes. thinking about what you're doing. It becomes a non-negotiable for sure. And those are the types of things, you know, we are going to give you a whole bunch of different theories, philosophies, and they're all, there's interplay between all of them. Cause you can see just, or Jason, Jason and I just mentioned, um, like th- five or six of them already, right? So the cold water therapy is a big one because what it's doing to your body is it is activating you into almost like a shock-like state and you are going to gain control over that sensation and essentially not jump out of the water but remain controlled slow your breathing there's a whole like the Wim Hof method is really um uh remarkable when you watch people go through that like even a very brief like day or two day training with him and how they you know combated a lot of their anxiety and what it really can do is give you confidence to um have control over those out of control moments and then suddenly you have more courage to move forward so every time you make a decision to get out of bed do the exercise class you have more confidence in your ability to check off those boxes more confidence in your ability so we just keep kind of adding more um yeah more check marks to the box there right So there's also things that happen at a physiological level when we're doing things like cold water therapy and that kind of stuff as well. We look at the vagus nerve. We're looking at the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system and how breath work. Again, breath work is another key piece of working through fear, right? What happens when we get fearful? We lose our breath. Yeah. (laughs) And ventilation, which then you start to become lightheaded and your your body just isn't functioning. Yeah. We hold our breath. And in that moment, instantly, the minute we are short of breath, which is why when I do processing work with clients, I remind them to breathe. And they sometimes initially go like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I wasn't breathing. And I'm like, it's standard. This is like, I I have to remind every person to, um, because your brain can't acquire new information if it's not getting oxygen as well. And then the other thing that happens is the minute oxygen is cut off in your system, your your sympathetic nervous system kicks in and says, whoa, I'm in danger, fight or flight. When that happens, the frontal lobe I was talking about before says, I'm fucking out of here. And now you can't make any clear decisions. And you're making decisions with your monkey brain, which again, I've seen them like sit on a branch, sniff their finger, fall off the branch. I mean, that is your monkey brain. It's pretty basic, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a, we learn this in box and people poo poo boxing. Yeah. A lot, especially nowadays in our modern political. Oh, I know. Climate. Concussions and all of that. I'm like, yeah, I can't. But it was one of the best things I could have done in terms of dealing with fear and anxiety and stress and learning how to breathe. Because when you're sparring, if you don't breathe, you can't focus and you get hit. Yeah. You can't react. You can't react properly. And if you let your emotions get a hold of you, you're fighting blindly and you get hit and you get hurt. But if you learn to breathe, and let the other person do the work. And uh, my instructor would always say, like, don't throw the first punch. Don't even throw a punch until you're ready. So you suddenly, you become very confident. You're breathing. You're just really loose and moving until you see an opening. Pow. Yeah. And then you just back off. But you have to be calm. You can't feel anxiety or stress. And you have to breathe. I'll let you guys know that he actually almost punched me there. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't flinch, guys. I had full control. I, knew I exactly didn't, where I didn't flinch. And then you'd lie and you'd say it was a throat chop. And I'd say, no, it was a face punch. <laughs> Not at all. I didn't even flinch that time either. I didn't flinch when I actually did. Okay. (laughs) So the other thing that goes hand in hand with breathwork stuff, we can start looking at things like yoga and, and yoga has a lot of like emotional and somatic, somatic meaning body releasing properties. And a lot of people will talk about that. Like I initially went to yoga because well, for you, your shoulder, or I initially went to be more flexible or I initially, not everybody goes for emotional, spiritual kind of mental balancing reasons. That becomes the bonus. I love that. It's like, that's the side effect of, we talk about side effects of being negative things of medications and things like that. I always love talking about the side effect of meditation is that it'll make you more successful. It'll make you more fearless in your business decisions. It will make you, you know, like from a really successful standpoint, that's one of the best things. So meditation, yoga work, breath work, all of those types of very intentional um, activities are ways that you can identify fear in the body, notice fear in the body. Sometimes you're actually doing the work and not realizing what that is. So today um, I did two Pilates classes back to back. One of them was a regular flow class um, that kind of works everything. And the other one was restore where we do a lot of like fascia rolling and Mm -hmm. extra stretching and more restorative based stuff. And um, I was being a jackass in the class, surprise. 
and we were talking about something and I was like, well, that's because trauma is stored in the body. And she was like, well, you're right. Yeah, yeah. And when we're looking at things like the pelvis and the throat area, energetically and physiologically, when one is tight, the other's tight. And also energetically like that, like our like sacral area is a lot of our like pleasure and passion and inspiration and intuition and stuff. And our throat area, our neck area, tight neck, all of that. I mean, that's where we express it. That is, I mean, Jason and I very regularly, uh, you know, exercise our throat chakra Mm -hmm. by spreading our messages, right? So recognizing that there's these pieces that are all interconnected. So if you're working out stuff in the hip flexor area and all of that, you're going to activate things that are stored in that part of the body and then the upper back and different things like that. So different emotions stored in different parts of the body. Um, So you can be doing a very physical activity and not even really realize it's activating and starting to process things. Runners, people who go to the gym and work out really intense. I've had clients be like, is this why I cry after spin class every day? And I was like, yes, because the bilateral processing of the body, meaning right and left, back and forth processing of walking, cycling, um, you know, even having music playing while our body's working, we are inadvertently unlocking everything in our body, rolling it through the cognitive part of our brain, which is often left brain stuff. And we're completing the processing. I'm circling my hand around as I talk, guys. And we're filing it in the filing cabinet instead of leaving it open on the kitchen table as an active memory. And that is essentially the basis of EMDR therapy. It's where we unlock where it's stored, where the event is stored in the body, in the somatic system, in our sensory system, the things we see, hear, smell, taste, believe, um, and, and, and like negative beliefs about things. And then we're able to unlock it from the places we've stored it and file it where it needs to go, which is in a file cabinet in our life that says this event happened, but I don't get a racing heartbeat, sweaty palms. I don't dissociate and shut down. I don't get a sore neck uh, when I recall this moment. Exactly. And it's, it's amazing. We should actually do a whole episode just about EMDR. Oh yeah, I could go on forever. I don't even, did I even breathe during that bit there? (laughs) I have to, when it comes out, it comes out because they're all so interconnected. And the thing is, is that like our body's always at a point of wanting to reach equilibrium. We've talked about balance so much, right? Like if you refer to any of the episodes around even like masculine, feminine energy, the battle of the gender type thing that we did, we're always in this state of homeostasis, right? If we're too cold, then our body's doing things to heat us up, you know, um, all of those kinds of things. If we put things in our body that speed it up, we naturally have a system that wants to counteract that. If we put things in our body that slow it down, like alcohol, our body releases things to bring us back up to equilibrium. So recognizing that there's always this natural state of balance we're looking for, you guys are already addressing fear. You're already addressing anxiety. Most of the time people come to me, they've got a fucking toolbox of tools, It's amazing what people have already navigated their life with. And what we do is like, I kind of teach you how to use those tools intentionally and use the right tool for the right job. Like when somebody's trying to hammer in a screw and wondering why it's not working, then I'm going to show you what the screw does, what the hammer does. And you can start to find where those are more appropriate in your life. Because sometimes we find one thing that works for us and we stick with it, but it's not actually a multi-bit tool. No, it evolves over time. Yeah, and right. maybe it's just good for that one scenario and it doesn't actually work that well in the other ones, but we'll use it. It's better than nothing, yeah. right? Like I legitimately have used a shoe for a hammer. Like maybe it's all have right? At some point, right? I've <laughs> used my nail or a knife as a screwdriver, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and exactly. and you you work with what you can while you've got that, right? So when it comes to fear, you know, the biggest things we want you guys to think about today is like what are like your top 2 or 3 things? where fear is the main thing holding you back. Yeah. So for you, Jason, when I say that right now with where you're at in your life, where does fear and hesitancy, and I'm going to say hesitancy because maybe some people see fear as being really extreme, but hesitancy can have some fearful backing. There's unsureness, indecision behind it, right? I think like not a lot actually, which is kind of surprising, Cool. which is not surprising. I think just for me, one of the things I think I mentioned last episode, that trip I'm going out to Canton, Ohio. Yeah. To fly out. There's some hesitancy just because it's been 11 years since being on a flight. Things in the States are kind of wild, political. You know what I mean? Like the world's very different right now. So it's the first big trip on my own. And I'm not, I don't, like I, I know people there, but I've not met them before. 
So it was just that's more just a whole bunch of fun. So it makes you a bit hesitant to kind totally. of really step outside of a comfort zone, especially after three years almost of like going nowhere. Did you see who you're going with? <laughs> That was the other joke. So the group of them going, we were like, you guys are never making it across the border. <laughs> Just get Jason to do the talking. <laughs> right? So it's it's interesting, but it just but that's about the only thing. Yeah. I'm still gonna do it. There's all there's a bit of a hesitancy there. Yeah, and actually what I'll point out too is that the feeling of fear and that hesitancy in there. You also are super excited. Oh, and yeah, that's same the time. same feeling. Yeah. So you're like juggling, you're dancing with both of those. But in terms of like like things I'm scared of doing or moment, there's not anything right now, which is kind of nice. There's times if you'd asked me like 15 years ago, there'd have been a whole truckload of stuff I could have brought. Yeah, up. totally. So that's with you. What about in the life around you? Is there anything that you fear for in the life around you? Well, I know my son's going into middle school. There you go. It's a whole new world. Yeah. Right? And that significantly changes your interactions with him, your role as a parent. Yeah. Our fear can hold our kids back in so many ways. And I'm trying really hard not to or put like my high school experience on him or anything like that, right? Because it's different. Things are different now. Yeah. Right? And he's different. He is The hardest thing about being a parent is um, realizing that your child is their own soul mm. and their own person. And they're not... He even said that to me the other day. I was trying to explain something to him. He's like, yeah, but I'm not you, dad. Aww. And it's like, you're right. And I had to say, you know what? You're right. I'm just trying to like, like share an experience I had so you maybe you can learn from it. But you're right. You're going to do your own thing. But that's that's a learning thing. Yeah. And that's fucking hard. <laughs> it is. And often one of the biggest things for parents is they have a hard time witnessing their children be in distress, right? Um, so it's it's almost like this, I want to protect my children so I don't have to see them in distress. And what I help parents process through is their own emotional dysregulation around that. So they can now tolerate watching somebody else in distress. Because that's actually what the issue is, is they get dysregulated. So they want to control all the people around them so that their world is more manageable, right? It is, but your kid's not going to learn unless no. they go through their own distressful experience no. and develop their own techniques, right? Totally. Like, Look at what Jason and I have talked about in all... How how many episodes? We're probably up in the 40s all now. About 40, yeah. Yeah. So look at all of the things we've talked about. We have talked about the shit and the grit. Yeah. That is the most exciting stuff. That is the stuff that I am most proud of. Like there's a lot of good things and I could talk about the sunshiny days and the picnics here and there. And I have a place for those, but like the inspiring, passionate parts of our journey are those hard parts. The hard parts are the parts that make you who you are. For sure. The good parts don't. They're just fun. They're good memory, but they don't make you who you are. Yeah, they're like the jelly contents to all of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you need the crust. <laughs> you do. And that inside that's just kind of <laughs> gross. Like mincemeat? I am a mincemeat fan. I am not. <laughs> how about you guys are you mincemeat fans no you know what i like that actually kind of segues a little bit to like bad experiences that taint you later on and they can be fear related they can be whatever i remember being in grade one we had this great family tea i think it was dinosaur themed to be honest i don't know why i just remember it like that and we were all in the gym and there was all of the snacks that everybody had brought and i thought i scored and i was like i'm getting that race crispy square that fucking thing was a tuna sandwich with the crust cut off. <laughs> what kind of... That's what... <laughs> that shit ruined me, you guys. That would, too. Yeah, Holy I can't... Cow. That's I... not Rice Krispies. <laughs> I cannot EMDR through that. No, that is... I can taste it while I'm speaking right now. So, yeah, that ruined me for a lot of things. So, you, I know you guys all got things like that in your life, right? Everyone. Yeah, for sure. So think about some of those things. So for me, like the, the things in my life that I'm probably most fearful about and think about it, we just came out of a couple of years of very fear based um, living in terms of COVID and things that we, you know, have to be extra cautious of and all of these things, everything takes extra. And, you know, you can even go back and be like everything that changed security wise after 9-11 and then everything that changed, you know, there's always something that's increasing it, right? Fear mongling. Um, just like that. That's how they say it. Right. Uh, but for me, I would say I'm definitely fearful and hesitant in my like 
getting into the dating world and um, fearful around just it's a different world to navigate, right? And also fearful around my own, um, yeah, trusting myself. Fear often is linked with trust, ability to trust self, ability to trust the universe, right? Like if I can't trust in myself, I need to trust that some that, like the bigger plan will fucking catch me. And sometimes that is my rule. I'm like, if I'm not using good discernment, then please remove that shit from my life if I can't. And things get deleted really fast. And I'm like, if I hadn't healed my rejection wound, I'd take that personally. But that was protection, right? So there's all these pieces where we can actually come in and give fear a hug by adding more trust into something, adding more confidence into something, adding more consistent positive experiences with something. So that's very much like the getting out of bed, the doing the thing. Like the more I do this, the more confident I am that that one time it happened is not the standard. It's not 100% of the time that happens now. Now it becomes 90% of the time. Now it was 80% of the time. The more successes we have, the less likely maybe that other thing will be to happen. So all of those are ways that you can picture fear being this scared little kid on the playground. And now you've come in and you've like surrounded fear with all of the things that can help it play the way it needs to play without getting hurt. Because fear really is about a um, our need to protect ourselves. Right. And that's basically what it comes down to. Yeah. And a lot of that, the core of that is like how protected did we feel? So going back to us talking about our kids and I, of course, watching my kids navigate just the type of world we live in now. There's way more demands on them. There's more demands on us parents. There's more things distracting us. I talk, I'm thinking about devices and social media and more exposure to things. Exposure therapy is another thing, you know, around phobias. That's a fairly it used to be fairly common I think there's nicer ways that we can process through things now but you're you know you would get exposure therapy if I did have a snake here well no um, exactly and I'm just like uh, right no way <laughs> you know airplanes like some people you just gotta do it you know the friend I talked about who was able to finally cross the bridge after EMDR therapy there's a version of exposure therapy in there as yeah. well because you would be using visualization you would be processing through you would be adding positive cognitions like picture yourself now and we do that a lot in like performance enhancement work picture yourself when Okay, picture somebody scoring on you now. Picture yourself recovering from that. How does your team recover? How do you trust your teammates now? For us, before the car accident, it was about trusting the other drivers, Mm -hmm. right? So there's all of those kind of pieces. So more exposure um, in different ways there. But I would say probably like my kids, that's another fear in in my uh, life right now is just making sure that I am supporting them the best I can be uh, because they have experienced some really adverse things. Um, you know, we talked about the fires, the oh, yeah. the school catching fire. Like my son has really had for the last five years of his nine, quite a bit of traumatic incidents between my son, same thing. fire, five years of plane 11, crash, right? COVID, yeah. and now divorce for, you know, for, for him. So that's a lot in the first nine years of his life, you know? More than I think a lot of kids have. Yeah, for right? sure. So those are all things that like uh, we become aware of. So think about for yourself, you know, where are the things that you are most fearful of? And then like we can still be afraid and go forward. We, you know, you're still going to go on your trip. I'm still going to put myself out there and meet people, right? But it's about, okay, how much does that fear control you? How much does it guide you? How much do you listen to it? Because that is going to give you those nudges. Like, I just don't feel good about this today. Or like, maybe we shouldn't go that way. Or let's double check this. Like, yep. double check the tickets. Like, I feel like something's, you know... Um, cause that is also where we get a lot of support from our fear because it is meant to tell us something. It is part of our primal system that says you're in danger, but it has been misfiring significantly in the world we live in right now because we are so activated as a human species. Way more activated even than we were a hundred years ago. Oh, or for sure. Years yeah. Ago, even right? 50 years ago. Right? For a sure. It's changed in that time and we're not, we still do have those monkey brains. We're not built for, we were not designed for everything that we're living in right now. Yeah. And that's the biggest, I mean, especially when it comes to social media and access to so much information, um, we, our brains were never meant to absorb that, right? Like I remember having encyclopedias in a bookshelf and that's how you started to learn. And there were just ways where you could filter the input. Yes. (laughs) Filter the input. Have you ever tried to pour too much of something into like too small of a hole? Like it's overwhelming. That's our brain. (laughs) You're going to lose that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, as many of these things to regulate uh, that response and really a lot of fear and that storage of fear comes down to nervous system regulation. It really does. Do you think, and this is probably a whole different episode. I don't know why it popped into my head. You know that whole woke culture movement? Mm-hmm. Do you think that's born mostly out of fear? Um, or a desire to mitigate 
fear and damage to others? Honestly, I think it's around polarity. I think it's around creating differing opinions to spark chaos in a sense. That's what it feels like. Yeah. And I like we can look at this everywhere. We can look at it in political parties. We can look at it between countries and sides of the world. We can look at this between Yeah, I feel like it's a bit of that. It's it's a paradigm shift. It's a it's a that's my hunch. Yeah. That's a but whole that's episode. a whole oh, other episode. episode. <laughs> yeah. But really, you know, recognizing what do you do? What's your first response in fear? And when we think about global bigger picture issues like that, that really don't impact our day to day, but impact perhaps how the world is functioning. We want to anchor into knowledge typically there, right? That's like one of the only things we can control is trying to find knowledge. People were trying to find knowledge. You know, there's all of these, um, you know, oh, I can think of a ton of different conspiracy theories of different that. And people want to dive into knowledge. They want to just find the facts. But then as things become more relevant to us and more personally threatening to us in the moment, you know, it's at our doorstep right now, um, that's when really that locus of control moves internally, right? Yeah. So it's funny because the further away the threat is, the further from us we can get, which is seeking external knowledge about something. But the closer that threat is to us, the closer that response needs to be, which is total internal activation of like a calming system your parasympathetic your mental control your focus you're trying to be hyper vigilant in that moment right yeah my father always taught me and it's a lesson i picked up for fear except snakes is that the further you get from what you're scared of the bigger it gets and the closer you get to it the smaller it is yeah yeah so his whole thing was if it scares you just just face it head on Mm -hmm. run right into it yeah Okay, so that anaconda turned into a rattlesnake or a garter snake. Did yeah, I ever tell it was you? still there. <laughs> Did I ever tell you my snake story? No. Okay, so I uh, I, I worked um, when I was at Mental Health and Addictions. We we had an office down by Peterson Creek in Kamloops there, and um, it was just like an old government building. And I remember. I was at work one day and I was, uh, it was in the morning. I had flip flops on. They did have a policy that you should always have closed toe shoes. And I really should have listened, but I had flip flops on that day and I was just sitting in my chair, all like sit back. And I was talking to my colleague that came by the door and I was like, Oh yeah, I'll give you 20 bucks for that. Some, I don't know, somebody's birthday or something. Right. So I leaned down to where my purse was under my desk and there was a rolled up, like a coiled up garter snake oh <laughs> right at the end of my toes. I blasted that snake deep back and was like I couldn't even say snake and I couldn't even move remember I had that fear that when I get scared I can't talk yeah that was kind of what happened right and then I just started laughing hysterically and people were like what is going on and then Gordon I remember thank you Gordon he came and like just picked it up and casually like tossed it out the door I was like what the fuck I could not put my feet down for weeks you guys it was like I was like who did I piss off there how did that thing get here because that just snakes don't just show up. Oh, yeah. Up. They put weather stripping on the doors as the solution. They're like, oh, it must have got in from the outside. I was like, no, that, yeah, that shit was, was planted. That was brought in. That was brought in. <laughs> uh, I was cool with snakes until then. A well, the, the situation like that will do it to you. Right? So that's what I'm wondering about yours. Curious. <laughs> Anyways, folks, that is our part two episode on fear. We hope it scared the shit out of right? you. <laughs> And at the same time, time taught you some ways to not get the shit scared out of you when you're scared. Yeah. Keep it cool, dudes. Keep it cool, dudes. There. We'll be back. <laughs> next time with your next favorite episode. Exactly. Until then, I'm Jason. I'm Jolene. Talk to you next week.